Hey guys, Comet here. Welcome to episode 16 in my Factorio Odyssey series. So I've done a little bit of work here, you can tell. I've got some Spider-Trons. I'm starting to concrete up the mall here using the, I guess I'll call them the house construction bots, just so that I don't have to do it. And at the end of the last episode, I did make a quick addendum to the first iteration of LTN in vanilla that I came up with, and doing some more work on it. I realized it can be simplified even further. So the trains don't actually need the extra weight condition that the circuit will fulfill. So if you notice here, there's no red wire connecting into this station to tell the train when to leave. The train will leave when an iron ore minus station has a train limit greater than zero. And so it, it doesn't need an extra circuit coming in. So the global network that I said you needed, yeah, just, just rip that out. You don't need it. And then there's a little bit of extra logic that goes into each provider station, but it's not too complicated. So I still have this combinator over here that takes the contents of all the chests, divides it by the capacity of the train, and outputs it onto the global network. And I'm going to use this as the inputs to a dashboard. So I can easily see if I'm understaffed or if I need to eliminate a potential bottleneck. So this combinator here on the right does the same thing, but its output is a cargo wagon instead. And then that goes into these two combinators here, which dynamically change the train limit here. But I did mention this um, in the last episode. You need a huge stacker because if you look at this combinator here, it's outputting 14 loads. So it's saying 14 trains can come here, but I only have a stacker of four. So using this combinator, you can actually set a hard limit. And then these combinators here just decide which limit to use, either the one provided by the buffers or the one provided by this here. So if the buffer limit is less than the hard set limit, then we want to output the buffer limit instead. And if the buffer limit is ever greater than the hard limit, then we want to output the hard limit. And then this combinator here just ensures that every signal leaving and going into the station here is L. So no more send to train, it's just set train limits. And so if you want to make a bigger stacker, let's say 10 trains, then you could change this number in here to 10. Or if you want a smaller buffer, you can change it to 2 or 3. And that is now inside of the blueprint book here with the provider station. And then onto the requester station really quickly here. You can see the red wire still exists, but that's just so that I can broadcast it to the dashboard. And all of these, I think, are the same as what I covered in the last video. Yeah, there's no changes here. So there's still the threshold limit set by this combinator. This arithmetic combinator here just outputs the iron only because this is the iron station. So it isolates the iron signal. And then it divides it by 16, the capacity of a train, and outputs it to these combinators here. This one takes that value and outputs it as L to the train limit here. And then this one just broadcasts it onto the network and it acts as a diode. So no signals from other networks can bleed back into this one. I also connected up some stone over here. And I've added a few more trains to the whole system. So I'm ready for more patches. Now I said in the last episode that I wanted to get nuclear done in this episode, but I forgot I don't have the water mod anymore that allows you to just water fill instead of landfill. So I think I might expand the grid out into this lake over here. That way I have access to water and then I can go through how I set up my nuclear system. So that means I'm going to need some machines making landfill for me. And I don't think I have any. I can set that up really quickly. Spider-trons are just amazing. Walk over everything. 
Okay, so yeah, I have uh, three Spider-Trons with the remotes here. The blue one is just kind of like my repair or builder bot. It has uh, RoboPorts in it. Then my red one here is my Biter Clearing Spider-Tron. And then this one is my personal Spider-Tron with all of the exoskeletons so it runs a little more quickly. But let me set up some landfill here. So I only want to landfill as big as the trains absolutely need here. Because you can't undo landfill. So I think this is a good opportunity now that I'm using up all the stone. You can see that this has changed now to providing 4 instead of 14. And 4 is less than the hard limit here set by this combinator. So if we look at the circuitry here, this combinator is now outputting 4 cargo wagons as the limit instead of the 5 by this combinator. And then that goes into here, gets converted to L, and that's going into the train stop, which has 5 out of 4 trains trying to path to it right now. So once this one leaves, there should only ever be three trains in the buffer here now, because my stone production is kind of pathetic. And once I realized how easy it actually was to set all this up, I did some research, and it looks like someone else has already come up with basically exactly what I came up with, and Nilaus did a video covering it. I suppose it is reassuring that someone else has independently come to the same solution you have. Oh, and look at this now. So, this can't even provide a full load. So there's no trains in the stacker. I may need to go grab another stone patch, if this is the case. I guess I could go grab this one up here. I need to finish this first, though. Well, I am completely out of stone, so yeah, I really do need to go grab this stone patch. I've only gotten... Oh, this much of the perimeter done. It should be incredibly easy to hook up another stone provider, though, with the rail network I have. I can just position the provider station right here, because I've made it so that it can fit really easily within the grid. And then I just have to belt over the stone. I just have to change the name to stone or plus. And now all of these trains that were originally trying to path to this one should see this station pop up. So this should increase my stone production a little bit. And I don't want to get the base to be too long and sprawled out. I want to try and keep it as a nice square so it's easy to defend because the fighters... <laughs> They're starting to knock on my door again as the pollution cloud grows. So I think maybe after I get the nuclear power plant going, I want to make a military grid that will build all of my defenses, like turrets and walls. And then I do need to come up with a... Oh, there's an attack right there. I do need to come up with a perimeter defense similar to what I had uh, back in like episode 3 that I never actually put in. I think it's high time I did put it back in. I don't know if it's just me, but when you queue up a Spider-Tron and have it run towards you, it's slightly terrifying. So this is something neat. Spider-Trons act as radar. Okay. Now that I have the perimeter railing done here, I can get into the fun part. And that is designing the nuclear power plant. So I'm thinking I'll have a rail plug-in similar to this, but maybe smushed down as close to the main line here as possible. That way I have as much space at the top for all of the reactors. And I want to have the reactors like in a line up the center, 
and then pulling off from both sides can be the heat pipes. And then for the water that goes into the heat exchangers, that can be taken from both sides of the reactors along this line here and this line here. So I'll start requesting some reactors and some heat pipes, heat exchangers, and steam turbines. And then I'm also going to have to get some Covarex going. I probably should have done that first, because that kind of takes a while to set up. Hmm. But I'm already here. I'm going to continue with my plan. So if this is the very center right here, then I know I'm not going to have any water here. And that lines up with this upper power pole perfectly. So the reactors need to fit here and here. Then there needs to be some room for inserters to remove and put in the fuel. Be some belt here. The heat pipes go like this. So I'm going to need a little bit more space. Undergrounds. Then the heat exchangers go here. Got some piping along here. And one reactor, so this is where the, the math comes in, one reactor can produce 40 megawatts, but each neighbor bonus adds 100% on top of that. So each reactor will have one to three neighbors so it will have a 300 percent bonus so its constant power output won't be 40 megawatts but four times 40 megawatts for 160 megawatts now the reactors on the ends so like the bottom down here and then the very top won't have the perfect neighbor bonus but as the whole system tiles each reactor approaches the 160 megawatts. So I just use that as the power output because it makes the math really easy. Because then you can come over to the heat exchanger and its max consumption is 10 megawatts. So for every reactor producing 160 megawatts, you'll need 16 of these heat exchangers. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 one more here so that's all 16 and then what provides the water what I like to do using two pumps here and here that can provide all of the water that all of these heat exchangers need so one heat exchanger will consume 103 water per second and a pump can produce 1200 a second so if there's 16 heat exchangers, 16 times 103, divided by the 1200 that the pump makes, you'd need 1.3 pumps. So I just have two for every column of these. So this right here marks out where I need to leave some water. So then after this point, this is where all of the steam turbines go. like this. So the turbines can consume 60 steam per second, and each heat exchanger produces 103 per second. So 103 times 16 divided by 60, we'd need just over 27 steam turbines to consume all of this steam. But I can only fit 20. Oh, this might be a problem. I may have to take up two grids with the nuclear and have the reactors down the center here. And I don't see why I can't do that. Yeah, let me do that. Let me uh, blueprint this first. So I don't need this 
big intersection here. And all of this railing is just in the way. So the center is instead right here. So having all of this extra space on the end over here for more steam turbines is important because I want to actually be able to over consume what the reactors are producing and then store some steam in tanks and that will control the fuel input to the reactors. So if I have enough steam, then I don't want the reactors to work. That way I can save some nuclear fuel. Otherwise, they'll just keep putting more and more fuel in, even though the reactor's already at max temperature. Almost there. I just need one more... There we go. So that can go there. And this is almost lined up. I need a little bit more landfill over here. I'm trying to be very careful not to accidentally fill in some space I need. That should do it. Yep. Perfect. And actually, once I place these pumps in, I can landfill over this water, and it'll become a water well pump. But to place the pumps, it needs to be in water first. Okay, but I have the 20 steam turbines here. And instead of going for the 27 I said I needed, I'm going to go for the nearest power of 2, which is 32. And that is 32 turbines. The power poles will fit here. And I like lights. So this now shows me where to not landfill. Right up this canal here. And if it's symmetrical, then the other canal should be right in this area. Got a water pump here and water pump there. Then there's a gap of one, two, and then the edge over here. So this is what tiles I think this might actually be one of the few occasions where I can use my T-intersection. Because I don't need this railing here in the middle. This is actually taking a really long time to get enough stone to make all of the landfill I need here. So I think I will also go and grab this stone patch here, and instead of routing it into the old base here, because this isn't really used at all anymore, I can send it to the trains. So this station is set up now. I got all of the railing drug across. I think I'll just put in some defensive turrets here, because the biters are relentless. Yep, they're attacking this one now. So once I eventually get my nuclear plant built, I need to make a military grid, or block, and then go around and just put a big perimeter like I was planning on doing earlier, but never got around to it. Because I can't even go out and kill the biters anymore with this power armor anymore. They're just too strong. I have to rely on artillery. Which isn't very upgraded yet because I don't have space science. So, there's a lot of stuff I need to get done. I'll just throw some turrets here. Oh, is this the first train? This is the first train going to the new station. Perfect. So that's what I like about this train system. I don't need to create any new schedules for each individual station. All of the trains see all of the stations, or at least all of the stone trains see all of the stone stations. I can just keep adding on more and more provider stations, and the trains will figure it all out for me. So what I'm doing here, I'm just trying to map out the right half of the grid. So I can figure out where the trains are going to come in and out of 
this double grid or the double block because I will be using trains to supply the nuclear fuel. Okay, so here's my plan for my nuclear setup. I'm going to have the reactors down the center here, and then I have the places where it's going to pick up the water designated already. The trains will come in here. They'll drop off not the processed uranium, but just the raw uranium ore, and it will do all of the Covarex and reprocessing on site. And that should keep uh, train congestion at a minimum. I mean, I only have a couple trains going around right now, but when I keep adding more and more blocks to the train grid, it's going to get really messy. So I'm going to copy the stations I have at the mall and use them as the blueprints over here. Because I want the Covarex process to be bot-based. It just makes loading and unloading easier. So the two things that we'll need to come in to make the nuclear fuel are iron ore and uranium ore. And then all of it will be processed, smelted, on site. There won't be any extra trains involved. And there shouldn't be any output trains from here either. So that will cut down on congestion. Because if I had a separate grid making the fuel, then I would need an input train for iron an input train for uranium, and then I would also need an output train to then take that fuel over to this grid. And so every intermediate step I can cut out of the process cuts down on how many trains are going to be active in the network. So this can actually be, yeah, another iron ore minus, that's fine. And then this station, not copper ore, but uranium. Or, And then all of this space over here, I can use for the Covarex process and fuel reprocessing. And then all of the turbines and reactors can be up in this area. So it looks like the reactors can start right here. Because that will be just out of the way of the stations over here. So the nuclear fuel will come in here, and it's important that it goes onto the insides of the belts here, because the used fuel will be output onto the far end of the belt. So all of the used fuel will end up up here, and then I'll just belt it around down over here where it will be reprocessed and put back into all of the reactors. So then there's some special circuitry here. Whenever the output inserter triggers, that's because the reactor has used up its fuel. You want to then insert back into the reactor new fuel. So we're going to read the hand contents of here, and it's going to pulse. Uh, stack size doesn't matter, but on the input, it does matter. So you can use either a blue inserter here, or just override the stack size. Make sure it's 1. And this is set to enable and disable. So whenever it sees that the output inserter has triggered, so this is if a used up uranium fuel cell is greater than 0, then I'll go ahead and insert. and you might think this is kind of pointless. But when you link everything together, you can trigger all of the reactors by the output inserter now. And this is important because otherwise you would need to sync up the input inserter to the time it takes for a reactor to use up its fuel. And so it's easier to just use the output because it's always ready. That probably doesn't make sense yet, but you'll see how it works. So the enable condition on the output inserter will be a green signal. Or actually, no, a red signal. So if the red signal is ever greater than zero, it can activate. And this whole system with these inserters and the way they're 
hooked up to the logic wires only works if the fuel belt here is always full of new fuel cells. So let the whole system back up and then go ahead and enable everything. Otherwise you'll have to come back and manually put in a single fuel cell. And that's how you jumpstart the whole thing. Okay, but what determines when the output inserter should work? Well, that is based on the steam content over here. So we need to link up all of these containers and they'll output their steam onto this wire. And that data will be read in to some combinators here. So what we want to do is take the steam and divide it by how many tanks there are. And then we can get an average steam content for each tank. And then to determine how many tanks there are, I'm just going to use a combinator here. Actually, I'm going to use two combinators. Well, I can use one combinator. So it's the rows of tanks, then times how many are in each row. So there's one row, and in each row there are eight columns. So then we're going to take R times C and output as the tanks. So if we look on this wire, we have eight tanks and no steam. And then this will just divide the steam by the tanks. So it's outputting zero because there's no steam. It will then be read by these combinators here. If the average steam is ever less than 10,000, we're gonna output a red signal. If steam is ever greater than 10,000, we can output a green signal. And then there's three combinators, which will take that data, summarize it, and put it back onto here and tell these inserters what to do. And they'll also trigger some lights. So if red is greater than green, we're going to output red. And we're outputting red because there's no steam. Now if red is equal to green, we're going to output yellow. And if green is greater than red, output green. So the enable condition here on these lights will have green greater than zero will have yellow greater than zero and red greater than zero and so right now it's saying hey we need some fuel so what will happen these inserters will try and output from the reactor, but there's nothing to output, so you have to manually seed everything. But once there is a used up uranium cell in here, when this gets the red signal, these will trigger outputting, which will then trigger the input, and then the fuel will start making heat. Eventually, we'll have a buildup of steam if we're not consuming all that power. And so on this red wire here, the steam contents will be read through all of these combinators, and it will decide whether or not there's enough steam. Once there is enough steam, the green light will turn on, and this output inserter can't work anymore. So that used up fuel cell will stay in here, ready to be triggered when the steam content gets too low. And if you're in neither of those two states, so if steam is actually greater than, let's use 20,000, that makes more sense, then it'll be green. 
So if it's ever between 10,000 and 20,000, then we'll be in the yellow state, where there's enough steam, but there's not enough demand to warrant more fuel. And so this just saves uranium fuel cells. And so as I keep tiling this up, I'll keep adding more and more to the R value here. Now this wouldn't be much of a nuclear video if I didn't also go over Covarex and making uranium fuel cells. So the fuel value on this fuel cell is 8 gigajoules, and the reactor only consumes 40 megawatts, and the extra neighbor bonus doesn't cost any more fuel, it's just free power. So it's only going to consume 40 megawatts from this 8 gigajoules, and we want to know how long one fuel cell is going to last. So a gigajoule is just 1,000 megajoules, and a joule is just watts divided by time. So if we take the 8,000 megawatts and divide it by the 40 megawatts that the reactor will be consuming, one fuel cell will last 200 seconds. So that means every 200 seconds, I need to make one fuel cell per reactor. And a reactor takes up five tiles. My rail network, each power pole reaches a distance of 30 tiles. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we can just round that to 10. So that's 300 tiles, then divided by the five for each reactor, that's 60 reactors. But then times two, because there's two rows. So there's 120 reactors, so every 200 seconds I need to make 120 fuel. So if we take the 120 fuel and divide it by the 200 seconds I have to make it, I would need to make 0.6 every second. So if we come back to the handy dandy factorial calculator, we want 0.6 per second. And it's saying we'd only need half of a factory that's not even beaconed. So let's put some beacons in here. So to keep things really simple, I'll just do 1, 1, and 4. So this isn't going to take up very much space at all. And put the beacons here. So that's one machine making the fuel cells. This machine will be making the iron plate from the iron ore. So this will request iron ore, and it will output iron plate. This will request all of these materials, and it'll output here. We need four machines doing the uranium processing. It's one, two, three, four. And then the other two will be Covarex enrichment. And then I need a seventh machine which will do the reprocessing. So I'll just do a simple belt to send the fuel over. And I'm actually going to disable this here. I don't want any of the uranium-235 ending up in here because I need it for the uh, enrichment process first. But now I think the only thing left to do is to get some logistics bots into this network over here and then pipe over some sulfuric acid to this patch and get a train connected up. And I think a good pull-off spot for this section will be right here. So let me get my blue Spidertron over there to build that. Okay, so that is all of the sulfuric acid connected up now. These miners, when you put them on top of uranium ore, they get liquid inputs, and they all link together, so you don't need to fuel up each individual one. But that will get my uranium production going. Now I need to go over here and set up one of these trains to go on a uranium schedule. So this is the third quadrant of the depot. So to go from depot 3, inactivity of 
three seconds. Uranium ore plus until full. And uranium ore minus until empty. And for the color, I'll just do green. That seems the most obvious to me. And I'll copy that schedule to a couple of trains here. And send them on their way. So now I will tile the reactors here so that I can see how the belting will line up. So it'll come out, and I want to pull only from the far end where the inserters are outputting the used fuel. So I can do something like this. And then it'll link up. And then I can run it along this way. Back around, down, and over into here. Or, I guess it would be quicker if I took the right side, not the left side. It'll go that way. Now, it looks like I didn't finish setting up the wiring here. Connect all the poles together. And I didn't do this side. So from the power pole into the inserter taking the fuel away, and then from that inserter into the other inserter. I can copy, paste, copy, paste. And to make sure everything got connected up, if I hover over this power pole, yeah, this wire over here gets highlighted. This will be a problem uh, later, but these need to be active providers, not passives. That way this always has a spot to empty out its contents, and it uses up the old fuel before taking any new uranium ore in. And then the size here should be more than one, because this can output two different items. And then the size on these, processing the raw uranium ore, I'm just letting it fill up to full, because it's going to take forever to get enough uranium-235. There's a 0.7% chance. So I need to make a lot of uranium-238 before I can get enough uranium-235. So these need to fill up. There's no way around that. Oh, there's one. I think this whole process here might actually take more logic than I originally thought. These need to be active providers, and then to prevent the bots from doing this, I want to filter these so that they're only Uranium-238. And then this row here will be Uranium-235. So this is what it should look like when everything is up and running. I have these inserters here limited to work only when uranium-235 is below 400. And over here, these that process the uranium ore work only when uranium-238 is below 2000. And then back over here, I'm not going to make any fuel cells unless we have more than 200 uranium-235. Then the bots will carry over the fuel cells over to here, that we put onto this belt, and come into the reactors. So I seeded these manually with one fuel cell, so these should keep refueling themselves, as long as there's fuel on the belt. So this is about to die, and there's no fuel on this belt, so you'll see what happens here. There was nothing for this inserter to pick up, so this is just stuck now, so it needs to be reseeded. But eventually, enough fuel will come down this belt to back all the way up to here, and every reactor, because they all pick up at the same time, it's like the belt isn't moving, so they'll always be able to grab something, as long as this is keeping up with all of them. And 
when you stack reactors like this, there's no point in putting heat pipes uh, vertically. And if you stacked the reactors horizontally, then there'd be no point in putting the heat pipes horizontally because the reactors act as heat pipes. So they transfer heat vertically through the reactors and then horizontally it will go through the heat pipes, at least in this setup's orientation. But now that there is a backlog, if I place one in here and one in here, so this is about to output again. I have this set to hold, so we'll see if that triggers this. And it did. Perfect. So all of these need to be set to hold, not pulse. So none of these turbines are actually consuming any steam right now, because all of the power is being provided by these solar panels. Oh, there it goes. So during the night, they will turn on instead of the accumulators. But now we have a reading of steam on this red wire. And if I move this spidertron, you see the light has changed to yellow. So anytime these try to output fuel, it will ask the green wire if more fuel should be put in. And that's determined by the level of steam. So it's its own clock. And that's the key behind stopping the output rather than the input, and linking the input to the output. So now, as my power needs grow, I can just tile all of this right here, place another one down, add more landfill, and I can just stack it all the way up. So I'll make some blueprints for all of this stuff and add it to my Factorio text channel. If you're interested in these blueprints, then there's a link to my Discord server in the video description. Just make sure you click on the thumbs up when you enter the welcome page. That way you get access to the entire server. But this is how I go about setting up nuclear power. In the next episode, I really need to get an outer perimeter going. I was attacked several times because pollution is way out of control. So in my scrambling, I've just thrown turrets around every ore patch here and I need to come up with a better solution. So I'll be removing this solar field here. That way I can use this space for more rail grids. I'll remove this old starter base here, and then once I have kind of a big box of boxes, then I will add an outer perimeter to it. And I also need to upgrade my military along the way. And then after that, I get everything settled in, I think I can start making science again. But that won't be for a couple episodes still. But anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.